Chapter 1 Clay My brother Boom doesn't even give me a decent greeting when I knock on his door. Normally, I'd comment about how the heavy wood double doors to his new ranch mansion are bigger than my trailer, but I don't feel much like laughing today. Instead, I've got a cold knot in my gut that's been there for days and feels like it's growing larger by the moment. It grows any bigger and I'm going to start looking like delicate ivy, all ponytail and belly. Well, set for the ponytail, I guess. Boone just eyes me as he opens the door. He's silent, too. My brother usually has something to say about everything. But maybe he's got the same knot in his gut I do. He eyes my clothing, noting my best jeans and the only long-sleeved white shirt I own, which has also sat in the back of my closet since the last funeral I went to. It's tight around the chest and neck, but fuck it. Ain't nobody gonna give a shit today. I glance down at my boots, but the heavy rain today is washing away any dirt I have on them. I'm mostly presentable. Mostly. My brother isn't happy, though. He just shakes his head. No jacket? Another smart-ass comment rises to my mind, but I bite it back, too. Doesn't seem right to joke, even if that's my natural instinct. Not today. Nah, don't have one. He grunts. Seems like none of my brothers do. But Ivy wants everyone in jackets, so come in. You can borrow one of mine. My brother's been married for almost a year now, and his new wife has pretty much turned him upside down. New house, new clothes, looking at investments, you name it. What Ivy wants, Ivy gets. It's a good thing Ivy's the sweetest girl and doesn't have a gold-digging bone in her body because Boone's absolutely batshit crazy for her and would give her his fortune if it'd make her smile. It's kind of cute, in a henpecked sort of way. Ivy dressing everyone. My brother just arches an eyebrow at me. I ain't wrong, I bet to myself as I shake off the rain in the echoing foyer. When I don't drip on the marble flooring, I step forward and follow Boone into the downstairs living area. Sure enough, Ivy's there, running a lint brush over Seth's borrowed jacket. Gage is seated on a nearby chair dressed to the nines in some Gucci or Armani shit, but he's the only one out of all of us. Knox is nearby wearing another one of Boone's jackets, but the way he's adjusting the collar... I imagine he's deciding whether or not to five-finger at home. Doesn't matter that Knox is as rich as the rest of us. He likes to lift things. Don't know why. No one knows what's going on in Knox's head. Ivy takes one look at me and hurries over with her lint brush. Clay, you're not dressed. Her brow wrinkles and she looks unhappy, studying my appearance. We'll have to get you one of Boone's jackets. Eddie wouldn't care, I tell her, trying to smile. He's an old roughneck, through and through. I doubt he even owned a dress shirt. Wouldn't expect me to own one. I care, Ivy says, ignoring everything I say. And his widow will care. And his children will care. It's important, Clay. She speaks to me like I'm a child, but it just rolls off my back. Ivy is a little fussy about appearances, but she means well, and she wants us to look right for this. And even though every one of us Price Brothers knows Eddie Mertine wouldn't give two shits what we wore to his funeral, it's important to Ivy that we are respectable when we pay our last respects. So I shrug and put my arms out. Come dress your Ken doll, Barbie. She thwacks me with a lint brush as I grin. Guess I got a little bit of spark left in me after all. I jack it up. Ivy fusses with my hair, 
removing my favorite baseball cap and wetting and combing down my flyaways like I'm a kid. I just let her fuss. I was the only female in our lives, so I figure she knows more about this sort of thing than we do. I glance down at her big belly and the tented black dress she's wearing. Junior's getting big. His name won't be Junior. Mason, then. That's a good name. Like the jar? No thanks. Boone just grins behind her like a big dumb loon. Never thought I'd see the day that my mule-stubborn brother would let a little blonde waltz all over him. But he does. I bet this baby's gonna have some trendy, crappy name like Juniper or Pastel or some shit. Ford, I suggest. Like the car? Good, solid car. No, absolutely not. Ivy finishes messing with my hair and then runs the lint brush over my jacket. All right, you look good. Are the wreaths in the cars? Everyone have umbrellas? We have hats, Seth says, a bit of sulk in my youngest brother's tone. Umbrellas, Ivy repeats firmly. This is a funeral, not a bowling alley. She fusses with the string of pearls at her neck, looking worried. I want you to look the part. Everyone's going to be focused on the fact that the Price family is showing up. We look good, baby girl, Boone says, moving to press a kiss to his wife's cheek. They're just giving you shit. It's gonna be fine, I promise. Ivy gives him a smile, reassured by his calm words. I wish I was so easily placated. The knots back in my stomach and groan. Ain't no avoiding this. Eddie deserves a good send-off, and we'll be there. I just wish... Fuck, I don't know what I wish. The funeral's a good one, I guess. I've only been to two, but compared to my father's funeral, this one's done right. Eddie's in the most expensive coffin that price money can buy since he died working on one of our rigs. There are flowers and wreaths all over the small chapel, and a shit ton more at the graveside. The service is nice and decently attended, and I try not to look at Eddie's widow and the three little boys she has sitting on the pew next to her. If I do, that knot in my stomach just grows and grows. Eddie was too old to be roughnecking. Well, not too old too broken and too slow. It's a young man's job, and Eddie was pushing 45. He just didn't have the moves he used to, and when equipment snaps, like it did this last week, you have to move fast. The good news is that when the pipe tripped and hit him, it hit him in the head. Never felt a thing. Just snapped his neck like a potato chip and boom. No more Eddie. I guess if you have to go, that's a good way to go. I wiggle my foot in my shoe, feeling the gap where my two missing toes are. When I lost them on a rig accident, it fucking hurt like hell, and I bled like a stuck pig. But Eddie would have gone instantly. One minute there, the next, gone. The world is minus one Eddie Mertine in the blink of an eye. I worshipped Eddie as a teen. He was a great guy. Worked with me when I started on my first rig. Just a shitty kid with a chip on his shoulder and a broken heart. Bought me a beer when my dad died and I couldn't sack up enough to stop crying even on the job. He was mentor and friend to both me and Boone. And when Price Brothers all hit it big, we gave him work. He's not great at what he does, but he's loyal as hell. That counts for a lot. Guess that should be past tense now. My gut churns again. A glance over and Ivy's rubbing the widow's back while Boone talks. I know what he's telling her. PBO's gonna cover the funeral expenses and make sure she has a pension. 
The good thing about being rich is you can throw money at people and it makes it seem like everything's gonna be okay. Except it doesn't feel like it's okay. It just feels shitty and this knot in my stomach won't go away. Someone sits down next to me. Even though most of the family and friends are getting up to go to the wake, I can't quite pull myself out of my seat. I'm staring up at the altar, at the front of the church where the coffin was a short time ago. Eddie's gone, six feet under. Shit, that's a mind fuck. I rub my mouth and look over at the person next to me. It's Knox, my younger brother. What do you want? You look like you're gonna puke. Knox comments, picking up a Bible from the back of one of the pews and flipping through it. I snatch it out of his hand and put it back. Funny how Knox can read me. Most of the time, no one can tell what I'm thinking. Must not be that good at my poker face today. I wasn't gonna take it, he says, but it's clear he's amused by my actions. And you still look like you're about to upchuck. What gives? He's a jerk, my little bro, but he's a jerk with good instincts. I cross my arms and shrug, sliding down to my seat like I'm a little kid instead of a grown-ass man. Just fuck. Reminds me of Dad's funeral from back in the day. Don't it to you? Knox considers, then shakes his head slowly. Nah, he gestures at the front. Lots of flowers. Dad didn't have none. He indicates the widow and her kids with another sweep of his hand. Got family here that grieve him? Dad just had us. All his lady friends didn't show up. He glances over at me. And the company men are paying the expenses. So no, it ain't much like Dad's funeral. I hate that he's right. I hate that her dad got buried in a cheap-ass coffin at an empty funeral. I hate that it didn't matter to no one but us. Even after all this time, it still burns in my belly. Dad was a piece of shit, though, Knox says. I know what you're thinking. That when you pass, you should be surrounded by loved ones. But Dad was a user. I mean, look at me and Gage. He smiles thinly. Yeah, I know what he means. Knox and Gage were born two months apart, two completely different moms. Dad was married to my mom at the time. He wasn't a good guy. But damn, we all deserve someone that's gonna love us until the end, don't we? I guess I'm just thinking life is short, you know. Eddie was in his forties. Should have had a lot of good years ahead of him. I nod at the three boys at the front. See them graduate from college and all. Hmm. So this isn't about Dad. This is about regrets, huh? Knox leans back and puts an arm on the back of the pew. And for a moment he looks wise beyond his years. Is this about regrets, then? Is that burning fireball in my stomach because I'm picturing what my own funeral would be like? That I'm not imagining anything but a few employees and my brothers? I try to picture Natalie here. But yeah, right. Her ass wouldn't be here if wild horses dragged her. The thought's fucking depressing. Both in that Natalie is disgusted by me and that I'm still hung up on her after all these years. I must be an idiot. You're wrong, I tell Knox. I'm good. He ignores me, tilting his head. So what is it you want out of life? Money? Success? You already have both. He nods over to Ivy and Boone. Our brother has his hand on the small of Ivy's back and he's gazing down at her as she speaks like pearls are dropping out of her damn mouth. Boone's totally fucking besotted. It'd be funny if I wasn't so fucking jealous. 
not a him and Ivy. They're perfect together. I just... I rub my jaw again, feeling the bristles of my beard. I haven't looked at anyone like that since... God damn it! That's twice now I've thought of Natalie in the same day. Must be getting moody. Don't know what I want. Ain't this, that's for sure. No one wants this, Knox says with a shrug of his shoulders. But it comes for all of us in the end. Question is, you gonna end up in that box with regrets? The knot in my gut returns. Maybe. That's your problem, my wise little brother says. He wags a finger at me like he's scolding a child. You ain't ruthless. Huh? I squint at him like it's crazy. You're the nice one, Clay. I am. Knox nods sagely. You're the one everyone goes to when Boone needs softening up. You're the one everyone looks to for a laugh or to smooth things over. Everyone's friend. You don't know how to be ruthless. You're so busy making sure everyone else is happy and smiling that you don't go after what you want. Is that who I am? Just a happy-go-lucky piece of shit who's miserable on the inside? I don't think that's me, but then again, this ache in my belly might be telling me otherwise. I look over at Boone and Ivy. She's got her head on his shoulder, and I know when they leave here, he's probably going to rub her feet or rub her belly or hell, just rub her all over. And she'll fuss over him, and they'll end up doing it on the sofa in the foyer, and someone will catch him again. And they'll just laugh like it's funny, and Ivy will blush. And they both won't be able to stop smiling. They're so goddamn happy. I look over at the widow and her boys. She's herding them out of the building, tears streaking her face. She's sobbed through the entire ceremony. Loved Eddie to pieces. And I think of Nat again. Nat, and the way she curled her lip at me the last time I saw her. Nat, and how I wasn't good enough for her. Nat, who chose her daddy and her family money over me, when I would have given her the moon if I'd have had two nickels to rub together. Nat, who I still jerk off to because I'm a sick son of a bitch with a massive hang-up. Gotta be ruthless, Knox says. That's the only way you're gonna get what you want. Maybe he's right. Maybe it's time I nut up and use some of this ridiculous money and be ridiculous with it. I glance over at Boone again. He threw around all kinds of money to push Ivy into dating him. Maybe I need to throw my weight around and act like the big man. Buy my way into the heart of the girl I always wanted but I could never have. And then, once I've bought her heart... I can hold it in my hand and decide if I want to crush it or keep it. Gotta be ruthless, after all. <laughs>